Recession? What recession? Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Friday extended edition of Real Vision Daily Briefing. With me today is Vincent Dillard, Director of Global Macro Strategy at StoneX Financial. Hi, Vincent. It's great to see you. Anyway, it's good to be back. We're going to be taking questions, of course. So if you have any, go ahead and drop them in the chats and we'll get to as many as we can. So, Vincent, we had uh, some inflation data. The PC index, uh, which we know the Fed watches, came in a little bit above expectations. Consumer confidence was pretty much in line, um, but steady. Are, are these readings that are consistent with an economy that's headed toward recession? Well, not by my, not by my book. I mean, you know, the way I understand it, we still have about, you know, 5% inflation uh, and, you know, percent GDP growth. So that's seven percent dollar growth. I mean, we have killed for these numbers ten years ago. Uh, so yeah, I, I look at the WRP on, on Bloomberg, you know, you bet funds future pricing and and you see all the red cut rate cuts being priced uh starting in July. Um uh, yeah, something better happen soon because uh otherwise this will be one of these cases. And there's been a lot of that where the dovish people will always be next quarter and they're right. pushing it back. Yeah. What what are you expect well, so we have a Fed meeting next week. What are you expecting for them? What from them? What do you think they'll say? Do you think they're gonna try to guide the market in a different direction, given the fact that we do have all these uh well, people think there's gonna probably be one more hike, but we do still have all that easing priced in. Yeah. Uh I mean, if I want them, I would walk it back. Now they they had they've been reluctant to do so. I mean, I I feel like my economy case, broadly speaking, has been incorrect. I mean, the inflation is more resilient than people thought. The labor market is not cool enough. I mean, we just saw that job rescuing numbers yesterday. Uh, consumption is more resilient. Incomes are actually outpacing inflation. Uh, so you have actual real wage gains. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk about later, but what I expect is a big pickup in infrastructure investment uh, coming from uh, the government sector and local government sector. Uh, so all that paints the picture of the economy that is much stronger than what's implied by the uh, the Fed on futures market. Uh, yeah, and if I were Paul, I would, I would, yeah, I would try to guide these people. I mean, this is not helpful. Like you know, the the, the, the curve is very inverted, it's causing all this here across the economy. Uh, so I would. I mean, the only reason why I hesitate to do that is that is because in recent meetings, it's uh, it's. It's tried to be very non communal, which I understand. I mean, we had the uh, the SVP crisis, uh, commercial recent revenue issues, so and also the they look like full with new guidance at the end of the day. I mean, forward guidance is, I mean, they've been so wrong for so long that I think now there's you know that feeling that maybe they shouldn't make too many forecasts uh, <laughs> because it can come back to bite them. So maybe you're going to ask, I mean, of course, the hikes, uh, but. Keep it light on the full guidance so that it maintains its flexibility, which is probably what the Fed cares most about. I mean, they don't want to pre comment to any path at this point after having so badly in the economy for so long. Yeah. So, you know, even if they try to stay non committal, though, if we, if we keep seeing these strong numbers, are we going to have to have a reset in the bond market? I mean, is the, if the bond market is anticipating there are going to be rate cuts, and they don't come, how does that play out? Uh, they just lose money. Mm. I mean, keep keep betting. I mean, uh, that's what's been happening, right? I mean, just keep buying, uh, uh, you know, buying the dovish people that never happens and, you know, a fall of inflation that never happens. So, uh, yeah, it's basically um, subsidizing the bond investors, subsidizing the economy uh, um, to get their fantasy visions of, of, of a recession uh, you know, in, in the curve, but that I means it's been going on for three years now. Yeah. It, a lot of people say it's the most anticipated recession that we still haven't seen, you know, but I guess the longer it goes, people think it, well, it must be around the corner. Now we had all of those rate hikes. Why haven't all of those rate hikes seem to have made a dent? Yeah. That's a, that's a good question. Um, I, I think at the end of the day, it's, I like to say we, we sleep walk in the right policy mix. It was completely accidental. Uh, but yeah, we were, and I think a lot of the anxiety over rate hikes comes from what happened in 2018, 2019, when uh, Powell tried to hike rates uh, and then he was forced to, to, to 
to backtrack the, the Christmas massacre of 2018 and then the repo market freeze in the fall of 2019. So there was this view, oh, we cannot go above 2.5% on the Fed funds rate, things are going to start breaking. And that's why the market has been so uh, uh, nervous, anxious. Every, yeah. Nervous every time you see a hike, oh, it's got rates, it's going to break. Yeah. Break. Well, obviously, you see an accident, which is, I would argue, still fairly minor, like the SVD, that people can start getting involved. Uh, the reason it's not happening, like I said, in Delft, Sleep walked into the right policy mix. So, in order to raise rates, we could not raise rates in 2018 because we have a highly leveraged economy uh, and, 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 and liquidity was a problem. Uh, and we also had a, um, relatively speaking, compared to now at least, uh, some level of fiscal austerity. Uh, so, the, the, the impact of rate hike was higher, it stopped the liquidity out, the government spending could not pick up the slack. But here we're in a completely different situation, right? I mean, COVID basically, if you look at any chart, um, you just see pre COVID and boom, new spike, and then resets higher. Uh, bank deposit, money market fund assets, uh, reverse repo facility. I mean, we're basically like force that five trillion of liquidity into the economy. And, and that money is still there. Um, my friend John Arthur has a, has a good metaphor for that. Um, he talks about the COVID Python, the COVID pig has not met the Python. So it's slowly making its way through the the five the economic five stuff. But again, keep in mind that like, you inject it, then people spend it, right? So that these these deposit moves on other people's deposit that keep spending it. So it keeps spinning around the economy. It's basically this kind of multiplier, multiplier theory. So that by five trillion injection is still there. You see in the PCE, for example, PCE is about six hundred billion higher uh, than it was pre COVID, even just in point inflation. So that liquidity is still there, and that has allowed uh, agents to deleverage. Uh, that means you see cash everywhere. You get private equity, so you want to your own cash. Uh, you know, JP Morgan is running cash. Uh, so it's it's still in there. Uh, uh, so that's one. And then the second ask, the second reason is is that the pick up in government spending. We we moved from a world where we had about four trillion in annual government spending to six point five trillion. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that is, and I'm I'm a fiscal fiscal type of guy. Uh, I believe fiscal policy is way more effective than monetary policy, and you're going to increase, uh, you know, deficit spending by governments are 2.5 trillion. That's yeah, that's money that flows from the public sector to the private sector. That means that people are uh, more able to spend, and, and the economy as a whole can withstand high rates. And I would argue that is a great thing. Yeah, uh, we're going to thought... get into that. We're going to get into that in a little bit because I, I, you, you put a very interesting research point out. Um, but but I want I want to ask you brought up SVB so I want to just touch on the banking situation because this is also there's some you know varying opinions about this so we saw again this week um, that SVB I mean it, people are now speculating openly that or forecasting openly that the bank will is most likely headed for FDIC receivership hasn't happened yet but the losses in the stock price just keep adding up and it's very hard to come back from where they are right now. Um, and some people say, OK, this is sort of there are circumstances for some of these regional banks. And then other people are a little bit more worried. My, my colleague, Andreas, has been keeping a close watch on the banking system. And he is he is worried that there's more trouble ahead. Let's have a listen to a clip um, from his latest uh, report and then we'll talk on the other side. So let's have a look at the three stages of the bank crisis. Um, I essentially think that we have now passed stage number one. And the initial outset of the crisis was this deposit flight from the um, SVB and other banks. While now that the dust has settled uh, on the liquidity or deposit crisis, the next thing that we need to watch is the response from a credit perspective. So how will banks respond to the instability in deposits from a credit perspective, you need to remember that deposits um, typically make up a large portion of the funding base of commercial banks, meaning that if there is a, a source of uncertainty surrounding that funding source, it also leads to ramifications on the lending side. And those are the exact ramifications that we are now slowly but surely gathering evidence of. The last part of the banking crisis, which is probably still, say, a couple of months or three to four months out, is the um, actual economic contraction as the consequence of a lack of credit being made available to the real economy. So 
first a deposit crisis, then a credit crisis, and then the ultimate contraction of the actual activity in the real economy. And you can watch that full Steno Signals episode on our website. Just hit the QR code and sign up. Uh, you'll also need that, by the way, if you want to stay for the second half of the show. So come on and join us. Um, Vincent, are you concerned? First of all, are, do you share those concerns? And are you concerned that we will see more regional bank failures? Yeah, it's an interesting clip you played. Um, you know, I, I, lo I love Andre Nelson. It's our great word. It's always a bit more pessimistic than I am on the economy. I, I blame that on the Indian Danish, you know, the country of, of Kierkegaard, Schopenhauer. No, no, what, whatever. Like, you know, some, some philosophers about these, these are some tanks of living. Uh, there's some of that there. Uh, but uh, I, I actually, I, I didn't see, I would agree with everything that he said. And my, my understanding from his point is uh, this is a process, not an event. Mm -hmm. uh, and when they are in it, my, my read from the market mission, Marsh was that he was reading the, the SVD as, as, as a Lehman moment or oh, like everything. And, and no, I mean, there is a process, which, which I think Andreas highlighted quite well, uh, you know, so, uh, the deposits are moving out, but now we stabilize that. So now it's going to be credit and credit's kind of going to be a, a slow drip. Uh, and I would stress that, I mean, I'm, I'm, my timing would be even longer than Andreas actually. Uh, so. If we if we stabilize the deposit base, which which we've already you know BTF P, yeah BTF P and the uh, FDIC insurance, uh, then it just it just comes down to credit. How how quickly is the, and how big are these commercial estate uh, losses going to feed through insurance banks balance sheet, and and it's going to be a race between these losses and banks' ability to uh, earn their way out and provision against them. Um, and if you look at the average term on a, uh, office lease in the U S it's five years. Uh, mm -hmm. so for now, the, the, the bill that comes due, if you will, are five years old. So that's 2018. And I would like to point that we had a tremendous amount of inflation. I'm going back to my COVID big idea, uh, that we had a tremendous amount of inflation, including on rents in 2018. So yeah. Okay. Uh, you got your vacancy rate is going to go up, no question. I mean, not even San Francisco. I mean, downtown is a ghost town. Uh, so your, your vacancy rate is going to shoot up, but you're going to reprice a lot of these rents much higher. So your servicing ratio may, be, may actually improve. Uh, so now, of course, as going back to the big movie, the Python, and as time passes, you're going to start hitting these leases that were signed down in 2021 at this absurd violation. Have certain rates, rates, uh, very high. So they're going to get a hit, but that's going to hit more in maybe two, three years. Uh, and a lot of things can happen in two, three years. Um, so yes, we'll see bank failures for sure. Uh, but I would, I would say, yeah, we see bank, bank fail, banks fail all the time. We have a banking failure resolution mechanism that works quite well in the U S. Uh, we have massive amount massive banks that are probably just you know already uh salivating at this i mean mm. fantastic right well where, where, where the banks get taken over basically you can buy the assets for free from the fdic i mean there's always there's some good parts in these visual banks uh you know jp morgan earns almost 25 billion in net, net interest income every quarter uh private equity too uh i think i'm on the last uh, blackstone call you know these guys already like you know Salivating, mm. thinking about all the good stuff. Like, oh, the the more the more regional banks go out, the more we get to buy stuff on the cheap. Uh, so again, my same idea that you know, when we have so much liquidity in the system, uh, we can handle it. I mean, it will be that it will be bad in certain markets. So, San Francisco is an issue. Uh, I would see. Uh, I think Dallas also has maybe a lot of overbuild. Phoenix is pretty bad. Atlanta maybe as well. I, uh, I saw a really interesting chart you had. I don't know if our folks can pull it up on the fly like this, but it was uh, in your report where you were talking about real estate. And I think we always think that San Francisco, New York, you know, the, the cities that were really hit by the work from home. But you on, on one of them, you showed Houston look like it was yeah. it was in the in, in really bad shape. And given energy and what's happening, I was sort of surprised at that. But I guess it has to do with the supply before we yeah. to. Yeah, there's a lot of deal there. Uh, big 
population migration. Uh, it's hard to know, you know, how long that move would be. Uh, uh, and yeah, they'll be built. Now, I I kind of think it's a place like Houston that they'll they'll be able to grow into it. Uh, but you know, in the short term, it's too much supply for for what the market can do. Yeah, it, it struck me because sometimes you can't like, anecdotally look across. This is why you really have to look at the data because it was a little surprising when you when you look at that rundown. Um, so we've got we've got some of that, but you see this all as trouble spots, points of pain, a slow roll, but nothing systemic. Yeah, that's that's a great summary. Yeah. Mm. It's funny. Do you think that we keep? thinking that's going to happen just because of what happened in the great financial crisis? Does that sort of ghost follow us around? Yeah, it's PTSD. Uh, I mean, I even myself, like, you know, I, I started my career in you know, six or seven. So I mean, this is the, you know, when you get a very, and I think a lot of people are like that in their early 40s, like you get a very traumatic experience when you're in your formative years. That's going to frame your, you know, the same way that uh, the 1987 crash, I know. People who went through that or the internet bubble, they always think that. Uh, and then I think there's some, uh, uh, you know, so, some uh, it's just uh, the mechanics of uh, of our industry. Uh, I mean, you want to be the hero who called the big, uh, big recession, right? So, I, you know, if my call is correct, you know, my call is actually nah. You know, yeah, the economy is kind of slowing, uh, but from a high base, and there are some offsetting factors. Yeah, the construction sector, the third story, the commercial estate is real, but it's going to be paid over time. It just means our growth is not as slow, but we're not going to be in a fundamentally different place six months from now than we are today. Now, this is not a very exciting call. Like, I'm not going to get invited on CNBC for saying that. Now, on the other hand, if I were to pull for like a, an 08 bike event with, you know, a sharp recession, uh, this would start to raise eyebrows. So, I mean, yeah. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of that on, on Twitter and, you know, uh, people refer to it as doom porn, but it's not very helpful. You're trying to make, you know, an accurate, uh, decisions about your money. You mentioned something in there about construction. Um, what's happening because people think. You know, the natural thought is higher rates, again, back to 08, housing, terrible for housing, for residential housing. But you point out we have a lot of uh, money and stimulus coming from the infrastructure side of things. Yeah. So I started making into that precisely because of the construction drop. So uh, one thing that really surprised me is if you look at the the, the, the BNS data on construction, you'll see that we added 200,000 construction jobs. Last year, it's kind of like, whoa, you know, and it really matters because usually construct, like, if you want for the whole Fed, dovish people theory, right, you need the labor market to cool down, right? And then usually that happens on the construction sector because it's low qualified, it's very cyclical. Uh, so it's a carry in the coal mine. I could not only know CX, even before things started to roll over, we had already destroyed uh, 200,000 jobs in 2006, construction jobs. So that is like, if you want that whole uh, bearish narrative, uh, not on the market, I'm um, bearish on the market, bearish on the economy, like recession, recession narrative, you really need construction to start rolling over and they're not. And at least on the cycle, we should have. So that's, that, that's kind of what led me to, why, why is that? So the first thought I had was, oh, of course, you know, we had the Inflation Reduction Act. That's like, you know, mm -hmm. fork. <laughs> As far as the eye can see, we're going to do the grid, the solar panel. I mean, $150 billion here, $200 billion there. I mean, this is, whoa. And then you know how these, these government projects work, right? It's, it's over time. Like, you get a big check to get the press conference. Oh, we're going to spend $500 billion building the 21st century economy. I mean, that stuff is going to be spent over five years, if at all. And remember, Obama and Orion had the... The shovel ready, stimulus pro nothing was shovel ready. I mean, nothing ever would, right? You appropriate the money, you need to get the approval, you need to pay the consultants. So, fiscal policy, you have these long, long and not variable lines. So, that IRA money is going to be spent over the next five to 10 years. You add in the chips act, that's another 250 billion, I think, uh, in uh, basically bringing fabs back from, from Taiwan and Southeast Asia to the US. 
with huge subsidies, and, and you've seen all the announcements already from TSMC to the Texas Instrument, Micron, I mean, and these are, I mean, fat is it's massive, you know, to build it. And they started working on that. So there's some at the federal level, but the biggest story and the one that really surprised me, uh, in terms of its magnitude, I mean, I knew it was real, but I didn't realize how big it was, is how much money stake and local government have. How much of a bonanza they got from uh, cool repayments from the federal level and then the capital gains soaring, sales tax soaring because the economy was high on crack in 2021, 2022, where we get 15%. Uh, so fiscal receipts way, way higher than people think. And they didn't have time to spend the money. And it's, it's not like the, the federal government can manifest money in thin air, right? Local governments are more complicated. So when they have such a huge impact of money, doesn't get spent right away. So it's going to be spent in the next two to three years. And keep in mind that when it comes to infrastructure spending, about 70% of it at the local level. Uh, so my impression is that what's going on in the construction sector is a transfer. Yes, there is the real estate market is slowing. I'll buy not drastically, I think it's slowing in any way, but it is slowing, no question. Uh, cre private credit is going to slow, and SVB and all that is not going to help. Regional banks are indeed going to cut the loan books, and everyone will ask there. But you'll see some pickup go from uh, the fis uh, uh, fiscal government, or central government, stimulus, and most importantly, state and local government. Yeah, that's a really important point, and it's not one that has been brought up that frequently. And that is a really big, important uh, support when you're looking at the U.S. because so much is done by a state by state level. So that, I think that's a really interesting and critical point. Um, I want I want to get to a couple questions because we have some coming in, and you just mentioned semiconductors, so I'm just going to pop to that one from Dan. How much longer can this stock market keep up? It says this five stock market, but I think that's just a typo. The stock market keep up. Algos are chasing Fang. Do you think the Nasdaq will roll soon? Yeah, I mean, I I agree on the uh, assessment. But so year to date, the, the Russell one thousand is not seven percent now, right? A hundred percent of that comes from six stocks. So that's it. The other 994 stocks, you make no money. The Russell 2000 index is now. So, yeah, um, Meta, I think, is double. Uh, and Tesla is not far beyond. Vidya is probably up 70%. Microsoft and Apple, the two largest stocks in the world, they up like 35% each. And given the weights in the index, that net just carries everything. So I agree with that. Uh, uh, now, when does it roll? Uh, well, I think you would need to see uh, while we were talking about about these dovish people insanity being at least pushed out, if not canceled already. Like, well, when we start to reprice and to understand that, yeah, we'll be in the four or five percent inflation that comes rate world for a while, which which I think is is correct. Uh, yeah, you do not buy the S and P five hundred twenty times earnings. You buy it at you know fifteen times earnings. Uh, so it's, it, it all goes back to the how long can this recession they have hold on and keep inverting the curve before they give up. And I guess they have a lot of money to lose. So the cost will want to bet against the economy and then they keep betting against it. And that creates this, this feedback loop, to the, the mega tech, uh, which then I think. Uh, the other thing that points, two things that points on, um, on the, um, the, the big tech phenomenon. Uh, and, one is that the, the point that my friend Mike Green always makes about the rise of index funds effectively benefiting the largest caps in the index. And clearly, that that process is at play here. I don't know when that ends, if that ends at all. I mean, you should probably have him on the show. Uh, we did him not long ago, but we'll catch up with him again. Uh, he has sure, a lot sure to say about that. Say. And then the second thing is, uh, I think mean, it was a post that uh, Josh Brown, the, the reform broker, I had a couple of years back, which I thought was, I'm going to reuse his term. Uh, in school, just own the damn robots. And I think this is probably happening with big techs. I think we, you know, in, the, in recent months, we've all anxiously played with chat GPT or auto GPT or whatever the new, new thing is. And we both had this, this mix of, wow, this is awesome and at the terror. Yeah. When is that thing going to steal my job? Yeah. We all, we all think about it, especially in journalism, right? Uh, 
And I think partly when, when I see like Microsoft and Google, like recovery straight up, I'm like, this is, this is panic. This is, this is a moral panic of the professional class. Although it's not just like, well, there's a truck driver that I got to have to learn how to code, which I, well, what no, the, is that? the AI codes, you know, even coders are getting replaced. AI yes. codes. Yes, yes, it's people who went to college. We cannot know that. Uh, so, so there's this probably reflexive uh, um, urge to own the robots that will take our jobs. Yeah, that, I don't know what that is. See that at play. I mean, anybody that mentions AI, you see their stock pop. Do you? Do you? If if at some point that heavy concentration into a couple of those tech names comes to an end, does d- does that mean a rotation to other parts of stocks? Or is it out of equities completely? Like if the NASDAQ rolls, the, all stocks are rolling. Yeah, I, I think we could have a scenario like, um, you know, 2021, where, um, you know, the NASDAQ is down like 80% on the year, and then the Dow is pretty much flat. So, of course, I mean, or the, I, I would, you know, if the market goes down a lot, you know, beat on, and I mean, also ETFs, I mean, that, you know, probably back. Well, 40, 20 years ago, people trade single stocks more. Now it's it's mostly ETF. So one thing drags everything together. Uh, we also have all these, again, let Mike Green on the show uh, talk about target date farm. Then we probably have a bigger segment of the market that is just trading beta uh, So that would argue for everything falling together. But in general, I would think that, you know, your kind of short duration value stocks uh, should be doing better. Uh, and it, it, that's the scenario. I'm using it both down, just one's down, then the other's down. Right. So relative, right? It's not g- great for equities, but relative performance, yeah. you, you, they do better. Uh, George asking, from your point of view, where would the dollar go? That's um, it's a tough one. Uh, I'm, I, I mean, my economy case is somewhat dot of wood, right? Because the economy avoids a recession. And uh, the, the growth, growth surprise to the upside, raised to stay higher. Uh, so there is there, there is a dollar bullish argument in there. Uh, well, but I, the, the, the reason I'm hesitating is um, I think even a dollar bull like uh, like a Brent Johnson w- would agree that we are getting a lot of noise about this whole devaluation. It's, it's getting to like a high fee the shop. Not all of it is real for sure, but you see, you know, uh, Saudi Arabia sending oil in Iran, uh, China, uh, Russia sending everything in Ruby and, and, and Iran, Argentina, <laughs> funny enough, uh, settling in China and Iran, uh, a lot of, you know, tension between Saudi Arabia and the U.S. I mean, I know these stories have been around for, for as long as I've been alive, but I have to think that there is more to it now, mm-hmm. uh, that there is a, a level of... Uh, Enemies or foreigners when it comes to the dollar. Like they, they, they don't like what happened with the Russian sanctions. They don't like US foreign policy. The search for an alternative is much greater. Uh, so I would think that on a, on a secular basis, uh, I, I would be cautious with the dollar, even though in the short term, yes, my case is kind of worse. Yeah. So from an, from an economic point of view, you can understand you're, you're leaning more dollar bullish, but from a sort of geopolitical you know, macro point of view, there there are some concerns. Um, there are a lot of cross currents when it comes to currencies. Well, there always are, but they're particularly right now, which makes it tricky. And then throw crypto in the mix, and you've got a you've got a wild world in forex that are, that's keeping us all busy. Um, I think I've got one more t- time to squeeze one more in before we have to flip over. Um, Aaron asking, what is the data source showing wages are outpacing inflation and which inflation measure? So what are you watching for that? I don't know. I think today's release, right? I mean, it was uh, and personal income. It's growing faster than inflation. Even the average hourly earnings, I think. Uh, and then, I mean, don't, don't quote me on that. But I think, you know, inflation is, is now down to five and average hourly earnings is slightly above that. Uh, the, the, the way I track it uh, is it, through tax connections. Uh, which I think is way better than, than all these measures. Like in, instead of, you know, asking people and doing these surveys of how much you earn and yada, yada, you just see how much taxes are coming in. Uh, and if you look at, at uh, uh, withheld uh, employment income, uh, it's it's still growing at a steady pace, especially when we take into account the fact that they, they adjusted the brackets for inflation. 
So the, the, the IRS adjusted the tax bracket by 7% uh, in, in January. And still, the gov- they see growth in tax collection uh, without uh, any council, not, not, not the capital gains stuff. So that means that it's all else equal, you know, if you adjust the bracket by 7%, uh, you know, you should collect 7% mass infections, more or less. Uh, but the fact that you're collecting slightly more than you were last year tells me that, yeah, uh, which wage gains are outpacing are inflation. And by inflation, I was just referring to the CPI. I didn't send mm-hmm. a lot of issues in kind of the CPI. Uh, you have almost equal run rent, you have rent in there, you have economic adjustment. Uh, so, yes, I, I mean, but that would be a whole separate conversation about whether the CPI you know, truly measures inflation or not. But that on the narrow sense, I think my, 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 my own stance. Wages are run as an inflation, and they were not before. Um, I'm I'm laughing as you're uh, and scrolling through the comments as you're saying that because I think Iris said at the very top in our chat, "I've never made more money than I do now, but I've also never felt more broke." And I think that sort of sums up what a lot of us are feeling when we try to like wrap our head uh, around and deal with this wage inflation uh, balance here. Uh, just a programming note before we head into the extended. So obviously. Um, if you're not a member, in order to stay with us, uh, you need to be scan the QR code. And I'm sure we've always got some sort of free trial. Check it out. Um, and then you get access to all of our other great stuff. But also, I wanted to let you know about an interview we're coming up next week. It's going to be live. Uh, when we were doing our meetups around the country, hope you, whoever was able to join us did. We'll do them again. Don't worry if you missed it. A lot of you were asking us to do something on MMT, uh, Modern Monetary Theory. Um, and talk to Mosler, the godfather of that. Um, and so we yes, are. True. Yeah, right. we're, yeah. We're. I'm going to be speaking to him at 11 o'clock Eastern time on Monday. So roll up with your questions. Um, if you can't make it and are going to watch it later and you have questions, email it to the show. I think Brian can put an email um, in the YouTube chat, in the both chats, um, where you can send your questions in ahead of time. And I'll try to do it then. I know sometimes people have stuff going on at work and can't join us at that time. But it should be a really interesting conversation. So I hope you can make it from that. And so I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you about that in a second, because I think you have some thoughts on that. But for those of us who aren't staying with us, have a fantastic weekend. We'll see you back here Monday. <laughs>